For years, tennis racket manufacturers like Head, Wilson, and Bablet have been lying to us. Whenever they bring out a new racket, they claim that it's got some insane technological innovation, which simultaneously increases power, control, spin, stability, maneuverability, and comfort all in one go. Most recently, I was quite offended by Wilson's paradigm bending technology. It sounds like some sort of sci-fi revolution that will take us into the next age of tennis rackets. But in reality, all they've done is add a little more flex to the throat. So in today's video, we're going to ignore all of that crappy mumbo jumbo and reveal six key racket specs that those pesky racket manufacturers hide from us. Number one, twist weight. Whenever a racket manufacturer claims to have increased the stability of their frame, it usually means they just increased the twist weight. High twist weights occur when the weight is distributed more towards the three and nine o'clock positions on the racket face. Most rackets today carry a twist weight between 14 and 15, although they do range as high as 16 and as low as 13. So how exactly does this work? Well, when you hit the ball, there are a lot of different forces at play. These forces change depending on how exactly you contact the ball. Obviously, the goal is to contact the ball directly in the middle of the string bed. As we all know, in practice, this is pretty hard to do. Twist weight concerns itself primarily with those times where you can't get that perfectly centralized contact point right in the middle of the sweet spot. Specifically, those impact locations closer to the three and nine o'clock locations on the string bed. When you hit the ball either to the right or the left of the sweet spot, you've probably noticed that the racket has a tendency to twist in your hand. The higher the twist weight, the greater the inertia that racket carries, making it harder for the ball to cause that racket to twist and get upset in your hand. There are two primary ways that racket manufacturers can increase twist weight. The first way is they can add more weight to the sides of the racket. The second way is they can just widen the frame, making longer crosses. This is why you often see oversized rackets with very high twist weights. So why don't all rackets just go with the highest twist weight possible if it's just going to make things more stable on contact? Well, the further away weight is distributed from your hand, the harder it is to maneuver the racket. So if you keep the weight distributed down this center line, it's a little more maneuverable as opposed to pulling it off that center line, increasing the distance from the weight from your hand. So as twist weight increases, maneuverability does tend to decrease. Number two, recoil weight. Recoil weight is something I've been very interested in lately. Rackets with higher recoil weights tend to feel a lot more stable, especially on shots like service returns and volleys. Essentially, recoil weight describes the amount of inertia around a racket's balance point. So if you've ever returned a big serve and felt like your racket is just getting pushed back by the power of the serve, a higher recoil weight would make your racket feel much more stable. We can increase the recoil weight by spreading the weight towards the poles of the racket. In other words, when you distribute the weight away from the balance point, you will have a racket with a higher recoil weight. While there aren't any inherent disadvantages to a high recoil weight, there are downsides to having weight distributed towards the poles which brings us to number three, polarization. The further away from the balance point a racket's weight is distributed, the more polarized that racket becomes. Think about this like the poles of the earth, right? You've got your north pole and you've got your south pole. So if you have half the racket's weight in the tip, aka the north pole, and then you have the other half at the bottom of the handle, aka the south pole, you would have the most polarized setup possible. On the other hand, if you had all of the racket's weight concentrated around the balance point of the frame, you would have a very depolarized racket or the least possible polarization. Polarized rackets will always have high swing weights and higher recoil weights. An example of a very polarized racket that you can buy on today's market is the Technofiber T-Fight ISO. 
305. It's only 305 grams, but it's got a really high swing weight of 338. The downside of these highly polarized rackets is they can be really hard to use. It's really tough to maneuver all of that weight in a head, requiring advanced technique and expert footwork to make sure you're always in position to take a full swing. On the other hand, consider the Yonex Ezo 98, one of the best selling rackets today due to how easy it is to use. This racket has that same 305 gram weight as the T-Fight, but the swing weight is a whopping 20 points lower at 318, something any player at any level is certain to notice. Downside here is that advanced players will really struggle to penetrate the court with such a low swing weight, requiring them to produce extremely high swing speeds if they want to get any pace or spin out of the ball. Four flex distribution. Obviously manufacturers do share flex with us. This is typically between 60 and 70 RA. This is measured across the entire frame and only in one direction. I gotta give credit to Prince where it's due as they were really the ones to open my eyes to the fact that rackets can flex differently in different locations on the racket and in different directions. For example, you can have two rackets with the same RA with completely different flex profiles. Take a look at Prince's data from the Talk Tennis forums that analyzes the difference between the flex profiles of the Phantom 100X and the 100P. Zone one is closer to the tip, zone two is in the middle of the hoop, zone three is in the lower hoop slash top of the shaft, and zone four is the lower shaft and top of the handle. Each one of these zones has a different flex, yet they result in the same RA. Not only that, but there's a number for torsional flex, something that's not even talked about by other manufacturers, but essentially it's like similar to twist weight, how easy that racket is going to twist along its Y axis. Number five, vibration frequency. Vibration frequency stats are not shared by manufacturers, but they are measured and shared by the Tennis Warehouse University. I think this metric is really excellent at describing feel. I find personally that I really enjoy the feel of rackets with vibration frequencies around 160 hertz. Higher stiffnesses and lower weights will contribute to higher vibration frequencies, meaning that there are more vibrations traveling through the racket during a given period of time. Lower stiffnesses and higher weights will lower that vibration frequency, meaning there are fewer vibrations traveling through the frame at any given time. Not only does this metric describe feel, but it can also be an indicator for comfort levels. Many extremely comfortable rackets like the Wilson Clash will have very low vibration frequencies. As with any wave, frequency only tells half the story. The other half brings us to the sixth thing that racket manufacturers hide from us. If you've got any questions so far, leave a comment down below. I guarantee you I'll get back to you as long as YouTube sends me that notification. But also, if you did learn something, please give this video a like so it can spread to more dorks who care way too much about tennis equipment just like me. Number six, vibration magnitude. Vibration magnitude is not measured by the Tennis Warehouse University, but I think it would be the ultimate indicator for comfort in any racket. When the ball hits the string bed, the impact causes vibrations to travel through the rackets. My intuition suggests that the greater the vibration sent through the racket, the less comfortable that racket should be. Just like with earthquakes where high magnitude earthquakes cause the most damage, I think that the rackets with high magnitudes of vibration would be the least comfortable and most likely to cause injury. And while you might think that that number couldn't be too low because there's no such thing as a racket that's too comfortable, consider this. When you have too little vibration traveling through the racket, it can be really hard to feel what's going on on that string bed, making it almost impossible to diagnose your miss hits and improve your game. We've all played with those rackets that feel too muted or disconnected, and it leaves us with this empty feeling as you lose that orgasmic sensation of a perfectly struck winner. Unfortunately, this is just speculation at this point as I haven't come across any research on that topic, but let me know if you think I'm just full of shit or if you agree with me down in the comments. Let me know if I've missed anything else that racket manufacturers hide from us, poor consumers in their endless pursuit for profit and we'll see you next time.